Welcome to another uh, welcome to another episode. It's not an episode. It's actually a uh, lesson in personal finance. And I'm using a tool at the moment that has <laughs> made my uh, made all of my screens change. So here we go. I'm back. I see what I'm supposed to see or what I want to see. Okay, so we are going live. Uh, welcome. If you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, I'm Jim Munchback, and this is another lesson in personal finance. We are in week number seven, and I am going to get my screens all ready, and then I will jump into the Zoom room. Looks like the Zoom room is open, and we've got some folks ready. So I'm going to admit everyone who is waiting. Welcome aboard everyone in the Zoom room. If you would do me a favor and just chat in, chat the time that you are, uh, chat in the time that you joined. And if you would also let me know you can hear me. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Good to see you, buddy. Hope you guys had a great week. Uh, I'm gonna. I am having a little bit of trouble. It's not really trouble. It's just uh, I've got new tools every week. I have new technology tools, and when I click on one, it uh, changes my screen configuration, and that kind of freaks me out because. I don't have that much screen real estate, so I'm assuming you can hear me. Gavin, can you hear me okay? Everybody, can you hear me? I think I have the right uh, mic. Let me get rid of my... Give me just a minute. Yeah, it looks like I have the right mic. Yep, yep, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're going to talk about bargaining and negotiating this today this week this your lesson this week your assignment I should say is uh, is bargaining and negotiating so we're going to cover just review the lesson a little bit and uh, while we're waiting to get started uh, it is 10 2 a.m. so we're a little bit early so welcome aboard if you're in the Zoom meeting. Welcome if you're joining us live on Facebook or YouTube. We're live streaming uh, right now. We should be live streaming. If you want to uh, make a note, you can find the uh, video. This video will be posted after the live stream. It will be posted to our playlist for this semester at uhplaylist.com. So that is that. Uh, and if you're not already subscribed to the channel, this is my personal channel, and this is where I keep the playlist. So if you like YouTube, if you like watching on YouTube, feel free to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. You'll get notifications if you hit the little bell, and you will get notifications when I post new videos. So today is Personal Finance Day. Tuesday at the Bauer College of Business, and I want to welcome everyone uh, again. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about bargaining and negotiating here in a minute, uh, but before we do that, we're still a little bit early, but I want to uh, I want to jump in and just kind of review, for those of you who were here last week, was the credit crush assignment, and uh, I still have a a lot of assignments in my queue to uh, review, so I will, I can't, I'm not done yet. So if you didn't get a grade, if you didn't get a score, then I will get that, to that soon, right after, right after the market closes today, I'll probably work on grading. Most of you have been doing your assignments early, and I really appreciate that. Um, so. Uh, keep doing that. I really work hard uh, Friday and over the weekend really 
to jump in and clear out my grading queue. And I focus primarily, I start by focusing on the students who submit the assignments early because I made a promise to you at the beginning of the semester that if you will do your assignment early, then I'll make it my job to review your assignment and give you feedback uh, in time for you to be able to make corrections and resubmit your assignment by the due date. And if you do that, you still get the extra points, even if you make some errors. So most of you are doing that, and I appreciate it. Uh, and so <clears throat> um, keep doing that. I am finding that a few students <laughs> are taking advantage of the early assignment and they're turning in very incomplete assignments. Just a small group of you are doing this, but kind of a notice, heads up notice that um, if you do submit an assignment that is just absolutely not ready to be submitted, don't be surprised if I renege on my offer to give you the extra points. So what I'm finding, there's a couple of kind of new things that are happening this semester, and I want to cover them a little bit um, as we get started. So before we get started, we're going to do bargaining and negotiating. That's this week's, uh, it's this week's lesson, and I'm going to cover what's in the in the assignment for you in this week's assignment, how to bargain and negotiate everything. Uh, and you're going to be uh, just telling me your story about bargaining and negotiating. So we're going to talk about bargaining and negotiating for a few minutes today. But first, let me uh, jump into kind of an, another topic, a topic that is not really related to personal finance, but it's come up every semester this topic comes up. So I want to just make you aware of, uh, and I know most of you are aware, but I just want to kind of put this on your radar to clear your browsing cache. I guess it's cache, cache, cache. I think it's cache. So if you've ever had something not work, uh, when you're online, if you're on a website and you it's just not doing what you think it should be doing, something that you know it should be doing, like, for example, maybe you jump into your financial plan at Right Capital and you're not seeing what you know you should be seeing. You refresh your screen, you refresh your page, you hit the little refresh button uh, in Right Capital where, where you make changes to your, let's say, for example, your uh, strategy, your investment strategy. So let me just show you this uh, credit crush assignment. One of the things you do is you change your um, strategy. So you're seeing a lot of changes there. The action item, though, you change that. If you hit that and then you go down and hit the refresh button, you should see this graph change. Well, several students uh, not just this semester, but every semester, uh, are finding that they have these weird glitches. And so I'll get an email, I'll get a text message, I'll get a, an urgent uh, help me, <laughs> which, uh, you know, I don't mind those when I can get to them. But the point is, if you have weird things happening online, whether it's in your financial planning portal or at another website, it's it's kind of like when my phone doesn't work, if I shut it down and reboot it, whatever the problem is will start working. Or if my apps are not up to date or my operating system is not up to date, if I will update those, shut it down, restart it, it will mysteriously work. And whatever the bug was, it will go away. Well, that's true about clearing your browser's cache as well. So again, if you're having issues like that, uh, please try clearing your browser cache. And again, I know most of you already know this. You already know that there are lots of reasons to clear your cache in terms of protecting your privacy and security and so on. Um, but it's also just a matter of clearing out the junk that's being stored in your web browser that will make websites act weird and not work. And that's what happened this week with a couple of students uh, in this week's assignment. So that's that. That's your cash. Just wanted to mention 
the cash. Another thing I want to mention, in fact, before I mention it, let me give you this announcement. It's 10.09 a.m., so I try to make this uh, class collaboration, the secret class collaboration element. Uh, I try to make that available early on in the lecture so that uh, you have it to think about. So I'm about to do that. I'm about to tell you what this week's class collaboration is. And what it is this week, the secret class collaboration, it's mid-semester, so we're, we're about halfway through the semester. <clears throat> Maybe not quite. But anyway, what I want to do is ask you to check in with me and give me some feedback. And just your, I want to know what's your overall experience with GroupMe. So you may recall at the beginning of the semester, we set up, had a bit of a survey and I showed you some items, uh, some tools rather, that we could use. And I asked you to tell me which ones you thought would be good. Um, so which ones you liked. So what I did, I posted this to Missional Money, and this is this week's class collaboration. There'll be a link in the video uh, for this post. But this is just a post uh, with some of, kind of, instead of sending you an email, I just posted this on the website. Lots of ways we could use GroupMe. I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, and then in the same post, there are some optional tools that we could use. And these were not uh, all part of your original survey. So I'll be updating that for next semester. But I just wanted you to give me some feedback this week about GroupMe. Maybe, maybe you're not using GroupMe. Maybe it's not your thing. Maybe you just didn't know about it. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. But I need to know. I need to know how you're using GroupMe and how it's working for you so that I can make changes if necessary. And so I may, in this post, I'll, again, I'll put it in the video if you want to look closer at the post. I put some possible uh, alternatives for other tools that we might consider in the future with pros and cons. And I also put kind of a list of things that we might do if we continue to use GroupMe. But here's the main thing. Here's the main thing about GroupMe that I want you to tell me this week in your class collaboration. How is it working for you? Okay, I want to know, how is GroupMe working for you? If you're not using it at all, if you never jump into GroupMe, if you don't even know where the GroupMe link is, it's in the syllabus, uh, then, you know, just tell me that. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's what I need you to know. I need you to know how GroupMe is working for me. And I don't mean like... I'm not giving an evaluation for how happy I am with GroupMe. I just want you to know the way that it was set up uh, was for you guys to have a space where you can collaborate, where you can ask questions to one another, and where you can answer questions for one another. And so you can grab those screenshots and include those in your assignments to let me know that you're answering questions for other students. That's awesome. Um, you, you will probably get extra points for that. Not a lot of extra points because class collaboration is worth 200 points. But GroupMe is a place for us to do that. If it's not the right tool, we can change that. If you're not happy with the way it works, I need to know that. If it's working great for you, awesome. But here's what I need you to know about how it's working for me. I don't go into GroupMe. So I don't jump in and moderate. I don't jump in and answer questions. I don't jump in and post content unless there is a reason. If you're not getting your questions answered in GroupMe, then I will do whatever it takes to get your questions answered, and I'll go into GroupMe. But as you know, like Gavin, for example, has jumped into GroupMe, which by the way, Gavin, would you jump into GroupMe real quick and just see if, ever, if there's any questions about the link for the Zoom? Just want to make sure we don't have a bunch of folks like we did a couple weeks ago that couldn't find the right link. Um, but So that's what I've been doing is asking you to post in GroupMe. So for example, I get lots of questions every week. Most of the questions I get are questions that I've gotten over and over and over. And most of those questions I've already answered somewhere. In fact, specifically, most of the questions are answered in the Zoom meeting. 
So students who aren't watching the Zoom meetings don't know the answers, and a lot of times they reach out to me via email, text message, even phone calls. Um, and and that's, that's great. Thank you, Gavin. I appreciate that update on the link. Everything's good. No questions in GroupMe. I appreciate that. So <clears throat> the questions that I get via email and text message, I do my best to try to answer your questions. I, I've asked you along the way to send me screenshots so that I can see what you're asking and you're doing that and I appreciate it. So as I go from meeting to meeting and do my daily work, Remember, I'm an adjunct professor, so I have a full-time job. I have a business to run, and I'm not available to answer questions throughout the day most of the time for you. But I still try to do that. I don't ignore you. But here's the thing. I need you to ask your questions in GroupMe because that's what GroupMe is for. So I'm just trying to encourage you to do that. Mainly, I'm asking you to give me feedback if there's reasons you're not doing that. If there are obstacles or problems or issues with GroupMe, I need to know. And we can find another solution, a better solution for that purpose. But the idea for GroupMe was and is to have a place for you to get your questions answered in real time right away. And so... Some students are really generous with their time and they're active and they're answering questions and they get notifications in GroupMe. And I appreciate you and thank you for that. And those of you who aren't using GroupMe, if you didn't know that, then hopefully it'll give you a reason to try GroupMe. And I, again, I will try to answer your questions, but my, uh, my mode of operation is and will continue to be if you send me a question, I'm going to ask you, did you jump into GroupMe and ask that question yet? And if you did, did you get an answer? And if you didn't get an answer, then I want to know and I want to help. And I promise you I'll get you an answer. But first, start with GroupMe, uh, please. And give students who are there generous with their time ready to give you an answer. Give them an opportunity to experience helping you out and grabbing a screenshot and throwing it in their assignment for potentially extra points. So again, that's just kind of a notification, but it is this week's class collaboration. I need to know how you are using GroupMe, how it's working for you, what issues you might see, and what things you might want to change. So sorry to spend so much time on GroupMe, but that was... Uh, that is the class collaboration for this week. Uh, so now we're going to jump into, I think that's it. We talked about cash, clearing your cash. Uh, I, it, I don't see any questions, so I'm assuming you don't have any questions. Based on my review of your assignments, you guys really understood the assignment last week, which was the... Uh, Credit Crush, which is one of my favorite assignments from a financial planning perspective. The uh, the Credit Crush assignment, it's really two assignments. We do the setup, which it just gets everything ready. And then last week we did the actual assignment. And you guys really get it. The Credit Crush assignment is one of my favorites from a financial planning perspective. I talk to people every day. I talked to a client yesterday who told me that they make really good money and they're in great shape for retirement. But she told me that she was looking at her, uh, you know, just a few of her accounts, credit cards and whatnot. And she told me these words. She used these words like three times in our conversation. She told me that she was scared afraid to realize that she did not know where all her money was going. And part of that was credit card fees and some other things. Again, really high income and yet not sure where the money's going. So we're going to work on that plan. But for you in the credit crush assignment and for anyone who's trying to figure out where's all the money going, a great place to start is to work on these debt strategies, to take all of your uh, accounts, link them, because you have to link them to get the correct data, and then uh, from there, do a little um, 
that strategy. Just select a strategy that can give you much, much better outcomes. And you guys got to see, like, if you look at the screen, this is Billy. He's our class avatar. And he's got some redonkulous amounts of debt. And so a lot of you are having the same issue, and we'll talk about it over and over, uh, the issue of having a huge number of savings. So in Billy's case, you can see here as we bounce through this, $831 million in savings, which is really a weird number. Um, but the point is, if you have really small payments and you have a balance and you're paying the minimum, the credit card industry is whacking you with this increase of balance. Your balance keeps going up. Interest on the balance keeps going up as well. And the payment that you're making is small, so you're never eliminating the balance in your credit card or your credit accounts. And so that's the whole point of the credit crush assignment. And it's a uh, it's a pretty important lesson in personal finance, not just for you, but for regular people who are trying to figure out where is the money going. It's like a first step. So I hope that helps. It's a very important part of the, the semester and the course, and I appreciate you guys kind of paying attention to that. So this is the uh, – I'm going to jump into – this is the post. So in the video, there's always a link to a post that I'm talking about. So if you want to see that, this is the one. So what you're going to do this week, I'm going to review your assignment now. Uh, what you're going to do this week is really just tell me about your experience with bargaining and negotiating. I've given you a little bit of kind of ideas for how bargaining and negotiating can help you. And I want to start kind of just... And this is this is just basic information. There's nothing outrageously insightful there at all. You could easily do a Google sh Google search or Chat GTP and find out everything that's in this post about bargaining and negotiating. But here's the thing you won't uh, discover: <laughs> Chat GTP can never help you understand you. So one of my favorite things to do is to ask Chat GTP three words: Teach me about. It's, I mean, if you haven't played with uh, artificial intelligence, we've had it around the University of Houston for many, many years. Uh, we use it to check to see if you're cheating. We have tools to check to see if you're using AI in your assignments. And so it's one of the policies we have about AI, but it's fascinating to me. It really is. It's, it's the way that it's expanded and become way more accessible in so many ways. So I've been playing with ChatGTP with those three words, teach me about, and fill in the blank. And it's amazing how much information. It's not like hugely, it's just basic information, but it's pretty usually pretty accurate. And I, I asked ChatGTP to teach me about things that I already know about that I'm an expert in. So I get to see how accurate it is and how relevant it is. And I got to tell you, it's a little scary. It's pretty impressive. It's way better than a Google search is what I'm trying to say. It's way more efficient. Uh, so anyway, I, I did that. Teach me about bargaining and negotiating. I did it a few minutes ago, and this is what ChatGTP gave me. Um, and it was, you know, a lot of this stuff is what I've been talking about for many years in this course. Uh, but anyway, you get that for free. It's maybe just not that important. But it is something to help you think about bargaining and negotiating. And so one of the things you're going to do this week is you're going to watch this video with Ramit Sethi. I met Ramit years ago in a conference uh, called FinCon, Financial Conference. It was it's a gathering. I think they still meet. I don't. I'm not active, but uh, it was a great place for people who were publishing financial content to come together, share ideas, and collaborate. And it was a lot of fun. And I got to meet Ramit. Years ago, he's a super guy, uh, very generous with his uh, 
ideas. This, this is way back before we had we had the internet, but we didn't have tools like ChatGTP. So he he did a lot more work than we have to do today to create really good quality content. And I want you to watch this interview with Ramit uh, about how to negotiate your salary or your promotion. It's just a great. Uh, I think a great video to help you kind of wrap your mind around the value, the importance of bargaining and negotiating. And he'll also, uh, you know, give you a few skills. In the same post here, uh, I have somewhere in there, I have my seven favorites. And this is just, these are just seven things that over time I came to believe are uh, pretty much the top seven things I would encourage you to do in the context of learning how to bargain and negotiate. And then the first one on my list is to bargain and negotiate everything. So I want to talk about that for just a minute. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because they're right there. I'll, I'll just mention them. But really what I want you to do this week in this assignment is I want to know about your experience with bargaining and negotiating. I want to know who do you know, what person in your life is the person you think of as that person is a really good negotiator. That person is someone I wish I could bargain and negotiate like they do. And so I'm just asking you to share your experience. But here's the thing. Whenever I teach this uh, lesson and we're on campus and we have a group of folks. Usually there's 50 to 100 students in the room. And I start out by by just kind of posing this imaginary question, which I want to I want to pose an imaginary question to you. And the question is, how much on an annual basis, how much in terms of a percentage, how much would you be able to move the needle on your financial life if you chose to bargain and negotiate everything? So in order to do this, in order to kind of play with this imaginary question, what I would do is I would ask the question, tell me, how do you feel about bargaining and negotiating? On a scale of one to 10, one being I hate it, <clears throat> I'm afraid of it. It intimidates me. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. My wife, Connie, uh, I don't have her picture handy. Um, my wife, Connie, though, she doesn't really love to bargain and negotiate. So if I come over here, I think I can get Connie. No, I'm not saying Connie. I thought I'd give you a picture of Connie just for fun, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, i got to get back where I was. So I just want you to think about that. Uh, think about, I just hit my think button and the thinking guy isn't there. There he goes. Think about it. What, what would it, how much difference would it make in your life? And, you know, use a percentage. Let's assume everybody is making the same amount of money. We all make $100,000 a year. And the people on the left side of the room, that would be my wife, Connie, and you, if you said on a scale of one to 10, I just, it's awkward, I don't like it, it's uncomfortable, I'm not very good at it, then you would be on this side of the room, the left side of the room. But if you're like Dave Ramsey, and if you haven't watched Dave Ramsey talk about bargaining and negotiating, it's a great, it's probably his favorite topic. So for years and years, we use Dave Ramsey's content, college content, for this course. And so I got to watch it over and over and over. But my favorite part of Dave Ramsey's teachings in the context of college students is his content around bargaining and negotiating. The dude loves to bargain and negotiate. He's got some ideas that I think are a little bit outdated. In fact, that's why we've moved on from his content. It was a little outdated. But like for one thing, Dave says cash is king. And I think in my in my list, I do say cash is king, um, but maybe not like cash used to be king. That's kind of the deal. But here's what I say. Purchasing power, the, the fact that you walk into a negotiation and you have the money uh, is really powerful. In Dave's context, Dave Ramsey would talk about it as you've got the greenbacks that you can lay down 
and that's going to move the needle in the negotiation. So, for example, he tells a story about going into buy a new dryer or maybe it's a washer and dryer. And you can watch his videos online. They're they're still out there. But he talks about how he's able to go and put that money down and get a super good bare bones deal and negotiate, you know, the dog out of this deal by using cash. And, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that was true. But today, if you walk into like Best Buy and you say, I've got cash, I want to make a deal on that TV or that computer or that washing machine or whatever, they're going to look at you and go, no, (laughs) ain't happening. But the truth is, if you're in a big negotiation for a big ticket item and you've got the money to pay for it, like I just bought an RV not that long ago, another RV, and You know, the fact that I had the money, in fact, I bought a motorcycle for myself for Christmas, a KLR 650. It's a great bike. And I just started calling dealers. I said, I've got the cash. I want to come pick the bike up. Here's how much I'll give you for it. Um, And if you're not interested, just let me know. But please take my name and number. And if you keep it on the lot through the end of the year, which is a pretty significant thing for a a car or a motorcycle or an RV, if they have inventory on the lot at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, they want to get that inventory off their lot because they're having to pay a carry cost for that and they want to bring new stuff on their lot. So they're going to make a deal. They may not be ready to make a deal today. In fact, the dealers I talked to when I wanted to buy a KLR 650 It was before Christmas, and they weren't really making super deals. So I just told them, look, I'm going to pay this much for this bike, for this year model, with these features. This is how much I'm going to pay. And I just wanted to let you know, if you have one that you want to sell for that price, I'll come pick it up today and give you cash. And so that's what I did. And I just kept calling dealers who had that product available for different prices. I said, I'm going to walk out the door with this price. I'm not going to pay an additional tax fee, documents, none of that. Just, I want to be very clear. So let me know. And after the third call, I found a dealer that's like, okay, come pick it up. I got in my truck. I went and picked it up that day and I paid exactly what I wanted to pay for it. Uh, Because he knew he was going to have it on his, he didn't want to take a chance of having it on his lot. And he knew this guy has the money to go buy the bike. So it's just Dave Ramsey's deal with cash is king. I didn't take cash. I took a credit card. Actually, maybe I took a check. I don't even remember how I paid. But the point is, I had the money. I wasn't asking him for a loan. I wasn't, you know, going to pay him out in installments. So cash is king. But I would say purchasing power is king. If you've got the money to buy it, that's really a powerful place to be as opposed to saying, hey, I need you to help me with credit. So that just puts you in a weaker position. Anyway, those are my seven things. Negotiate everything and any, anything and everything. So you're either on this side of the room or that side of the room. Back to the original question. If you're on this left side of the room and you just you just don't bargain and negotiate because it's just not uh, it's just not fun for you it's not something you enjoy doing so you don't do it versus the other folks on the other side of the room that's my side of the room and Dave Ramsey's side of the room we think everything is negotiable and we're willing to bargain at least try to bargain everything so my question is if we all make the same amount of money And let's assume that we all have the same basket of goods and services that we spend our money on. So everything's equal. We make 100 grand a year. We spend, let's say we spend 80 grand a year and we save 20% of it. We're good stewards of our money. But here's the thing. The people on the left side of the room, they're spending $80,000 getting the same basket of goods. The people on the right side of the room, those who bargain and negotiate everything, the $80,000 that they spend out of their $100,000 income, do you think they do better or the same? Or do you think the people who don't negotiate anything do better? And if so, what's the percentage? Again, it's, it's, just, a, it's just an imaginary question. But tell me, 
what percentage difference do you think someone would have if they bargain and negotiate for everything that they buy? What percentage? 10%? 20%? Do you think a person who makes $100,000 and bargains and negotiates everything in their life could save $10,000 a year on their rent, on their car, on their uh, insurance, on their internet, on you name it, whatever it is we're buying, how much money percentage-wise, do you think you could save if you decided to bargain and negotiate everything? I'm looking for a percentage. I'm looking in the chat, and I'm not seeing it. So come on, guys, in the, in the Zoom meeting, pop that into the chat. What percentage do you think it would make a difference in one year for someone who decides they're going to learn the skills to bargain and negotiate everything? Their raise, their pay, their benefits, their car, their house, their internet. Did I say internet? Their phone, their phone services. So what do you think? Okay, I'm looking and I'm not seeing any comments, which makes me always wonder, are you guys there? Are you listening? Gavin, I know you're there because you're always there. And I appreciate that. Uh, what about the rest of you? Lanny, maybe, uh, Greg? Anyone else who's, and if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, now is the time for you to pop a percentage in there. It makes me wonder if it's not clear what I'm asking. I'm asking for you to consider, to think about, tell me what is the difference between not bargaining, not negotiating anything versus someone who bargains and negotiates everything. So, Here's a little story. Uh, I have a friend. Her name is Debbie. She negotiates everything. It's a little annoying, actually. She's brutal, too. She is like she just she's brutal. She did. She, she's really good at it, though. I mean, and I'm not I'm not um, putting her down. I'm just saying she is she's like off the scale bargain and negotiate everything. And so uh, Debbie, Debbie's the one who taught me how to go and negotiate or bargain for my appraisal. If you own a home and you pay property taxes, I live in Friendswood. And every year since I've lived here, since the year 2000, I moved here in July of 2000, every year the value of my property has gone up according to the appraisal district. Every year. And so what you can do is you can go and protest uh, your appraisal. And to do that, you just get some documentation. It's, it's super easy to do, too. You just create a list of things that your house would need to have repaired uh, in order to sell for the price that they're saying it appraised for. So it's pretty simple, uh, straightforward process. You just make a list. In my case, I've got tons of things that if we sold our house for what they're saying it would sell for, uh, we'd have to fix this and that and the other thing. And it's a long list of things that I've come up with over the years. So you just go in, you give them your documentation. You say, I want to protest the appraisal. And just by going in, typically, they will drop the value of your home by 10 to 20 percent. If you don't go in, you don't protest, you don't, it doesn't happen. The value goes up and up. And the key is, the thing is, and this is what Debbie taught me, Debbie, the person who negotiates everything, uh, she taught me that if you don't go and protest every year when it goes up, you can never go back and protest for previous years. You have to do it every year. And every year that you do it, you can prevent it from going up so much. But you can never go back and have it go down. So she does it every year. And I started doing it every year. Every once in a while, I forget to do it. And then I kick myself because I know I miss the opportunity to uh, contest it for that year. So that's, that's just one example. By the way, in doing that, I save between $1,000 and $1,500 on my annual taxes. So let me ask you again. If we all made the same amount of money, $100,000, and we all spent this, purchased the same things, products and services, 
Do you have a clue? Do you think, is there a number that comes to mind that you would say the people who bargain and negotiate everything like Debbie are going to be 10% better off? Are they going to save 10% overall in everything they spend? Are they going to save 5%? What do you think? What percentage do you think they're going to be better off? <clears throat> so that's the question. And I don't see any answers. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking either I'm not live or, you know, maybe I'm froze up. Maybe my Zoom is froze up. That happens every once in a while, right? Even though I have like 5,000 megabytes of download speed. I'm sitting here wondering why I'm not seeing any chat in the Zoom. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to say it again. Gavin, are you there? I'm going to put a, I'm going to, I'm going to put a, anyone listening okay thanks i see i see five gavin thank you i appreciate that gavin you're like the only one there everyone else i think maybe watching netflix i don't know but let's just check something just for fun i'm going to jump into netflix and i'm going to see what's going on with netflix because um, netflix is Netflix has just been on a rip. That's a one-day chart. So anyway, just curious. I think that's where everybody is. They're on Netflix. That could be. But thank you, Gavin. I did freeze on you. That makes me happy, Lanny, because by freezing on you, that means that there's a reason why nobody's answering. So I, I don't know why I froze. I don't think I froze. Maybe you froze, but um, I'm not sure. I'll know when I get done. I'll get the data for this live stream. So I think you're right, Gavin, between 5 to 10 percent. That's pretty much what I always say. If you decide you're going to bargain and negotiate everything, chances are you're going to be 5 or 10 percent ahead. So let's just take the 10 percent and assume again you're making 100 grand. You spend 8 grand or I'm sorry, 80 grand on all the products and services, including, you know, the entertainment and whatever, your motorcycle, your RV, your boat, your car everything, your internet, your phone, you name it. You spend 80 grand a year. That's not unreasonable once you start making a decent amount of money. You're saving 20% and spending the rest. That's not a bad plan. That's how I built my wealth. I saved first and then I spent everything else. Uh, but I tried to bargain and negotiate everything. So let's say 80 grand a year. If you're saving 10%, that's how much? If you're spending 80 grand a year and you're saving 10%, how much are you saving? Yeah, $8,000 a year. So what happens after 10 years of doing that? You've saved $80,000. So is it worth it to you? And who knows that, you know, that may not be the right percentage, but I promise you if you have someone in your life like uh, my friend Debbie, who you just kind of watch and think about how they operate in terms of how much money they save when they decide that it's worth taking a chance to try to bargain or negotiate whatever it is they're buying, you'll find that it's it moves the needle. And so that's what I want you to think about this week, because I know there are a lot of people on that side of the room who just do not bargain do not negotiate because it's awkward. It's not fun. And I'm telling you, if you learn just a few basic skills, starting with the idea that everything's negotiable. It, and I know that's not true. Not everything is negotiable. OK, I know that. But most things are. And if your mindset is everything's negotiable, you're going to try to bargain and negotiate on everything. And if your mindset is, I'm just not going to do it, you're not going to do it. And if you don't do it versus the person who always tries to do it, it's going to be a significant difference in terms of outcomes. That's why this is part, bargaining and negotiating is part of this semester of personal finance. So this week, the assignment is very simple. I just want to know 
How are you feeling? What are you doing? What is your approach to bargaining and negotiating? And that's hopefully going to help you. Uh, I know it can help you if you choose to make the decision to develop some better skills about bargaining and negotiating. Because if you're avoiding it because it's awkward, it's not fun, I get that. You know, a lot of things aren't fun, but if you recognize the benefit and the value, then you'll be motivated to start somewhere and develop a couple of skills. And I think this is a pretty good list. Negoti- just change your mindset and think, okay, yeah, things are negotiable. And then um, don't forget to exercise your walkaway muscle because everyone watching this uh, live stream right now, every single person watching this is there's something you want to buy. There's something, a big ticket item that you want. And so the more you want it, the more you have to have it, the, the worse off you're going to be in a bargaining situation or a negotiation. So you have to be willing to walk away from the deal. And you need to be willing to communicate that in a convincing way. And then you have more power in the negotiation. Again, think about the way that I did that motorcycle deal. Um, My KLR 650 is a great motorcycle, but there are a bunch of them out there and there was no specific one that I had to have. And so it was it was easy for me to communicate that to the dealers because it was true and it was totally true. But if you, you know, fall in love with that puppy dog and you have to have it, and the other person is a half decent negotiator, they're going to recognize that. So you got to exercise that walk away muscle. And you got to practice this kind of the same thing, maybe, but practice the daily discipline of being patient. So, again, you know, my motorcycle story I wanted that motorcycle. I had some things I really wanted to do. It was a great time of year to be on a motorcycle, it's kind of a dirt bike, road bike, and I wanted to be riding it, but. I had to practice the discipline of being patient because I knew that I would get a better deal. And I knew that over the long run, that was important to me. So you have to practice that. Comparison shopping is also really important. And it builds uh, three kinds of muscle, although I think I only have two listed. (laughs) But you know how comparison shopping works. If you don't know what's out there and you can't compare this product and that product and this price versus that price, and if you're not, if you don't know what features. So, for example, when I bought my KLR 650, uh, they redesigned that bike in 2022. So, 22 and 23, those two years are pretty much the same. Everything before that was very different. The machine was very different. The upgrades they did in 2022 were pretty significant. Like they gave it fuel injection, they gave it a better suspension. Uh, What else did they do? A couple of things, but those two things by themselves made it uh, a much better machine. It was already an awesome bike. I think dollar for dollar, pound for pound, KLR 650 is the best motorcycle ever built. And I paid $6,500 for mine. But here's the thing. I paid $6,500, which was a decent price. That was walkout, no tax, no any, that was everything included. Um, And that was a decent price. I could have got a better price. I could have gotten a lower price. But I got a beautiful bike, you know, for $6,500. But here's the thing. I honestly thought I was getting one one of the things they added was ABS, anti-lock brake system. And if you're on a motorcycle and you're on the road, my bike, it'll do 70, 80 miles an hour. It's kind of vibrating like crazy when you do that. But if you're doing that fast on the road and you hit the brake, you want to have anti-lock brake system on a motorcycle. That didn't even exist until 2022, ABS. So when I bought my KLR650, I thought I was getting ABS. Turns out that wasn't a feature on my bike. So I thought I was getting a better deal than I was getting. Now when I hit my brake doing 70 miles an hour on a road, it locks up the back wheel pretty quick. So I'm stuck with a bike that can... Uh, lock up the back wheel pretty quick. 
if I would have paid attention and done a little better job of comparison shopping, I would have been able to make sure that I had the right features and benefits on the machine that I was buying. So don't make the same mistake I made. We already talked about cash is king. Here's a good one. Silence is golden, so shut up. If you're ever in a negotiation, one of the things Dave Ramsey says is, that's not good enough. So if you're, you know, they tell you the price for that motorcycle or that car or whatever, you just respond by saying, you know what, that's, that's just not good enough. And then you be quiet. And that silence, that pregnant pause has a pretty impactful, uh, pretty, it can impact that negotiation pretty significantly. So try that. It's a simple skill. It's worth trying. And I want to encourage you, again, to develop some basic skills and just do that. Timing, timing, timing is everything, especially when you're talking about a car, uh, anything that sits on a lot in terms of inventory, big time. Timing matters. So just know that. Know that you have the advantage if you understand that this vehicle that you're trying to buy has been on the lot for a long time. Now, if you have to have it and it just got on the lot yesterday and you absolutely have to have it, good luck. You're going to pay more for that. And the dealers are looking for you. They want to meet you because you will pay more than I will pay. Because I don't have to have the hottest, newest, the one that just came on the lot because it's new. Like, I don't have to have that. But if you do, you will pay more for it. So part of the deal in bargaining and negotiating is just recognize that if you're willing to wait, timing matters. So those are my top seven. You may have your own, and I sure would like to hear about them. So that is, I'm looking for, uh, yeah, probably, Lanny says it's probably the UH Wi-Fi. You know what, though? When I'm in my office at U of H, I have a thousand megabytes download and a thousand megabytes upload. It's the fastest internet I've ever experienced anywhere. I'm in my home studio right now and I have Comcast and I think I'm probably around a hundred in my studio. I have less speed than I have in my house, but it's still pretty good, but it's not as good as U of H. U of H is amazing, at least in my office. So anyway, that's that. Let's see. Uh, I am going to, what am I going to do? I think I'm going to wrap it up there because it is 1051 AM. I don't see like right now I'm blurry. Really? Oh, you know what? I see I'm blurry too. I wonder why that is. Did I just get unblurry and then blurry again? You know what, Lanny? I am blurry. I'm looking at my monitor and I'm blurry, and I don't know why, but I'm going to have to figure that out. Yeah, so that's weird. I think I'm going to just check something real quick. I'm going to go... Yeah, I don't know why, but I'll figure that out between now and next week. I apologize for that. The blurriness, that's not good. Okay, any questions? Uh, it may be the camera reacting, uh, Gavin, but I'm noticing that it's blurry, like the logo for University of Houston is blurry too. And Money Study Group, if you look at the, the logo there, that's blurry too, which is weird. It usually doesn't happen. I think, you know what I think it is? I think it's, uh, my MacBook is somehow interfacing with my whole, it's blurry clear, then blurry again. Well, I'm sorry for that. I know you can't see my facial expression, but let me just tell you, I'm very sorry for that. And I will get it fixed. It looks like maybe I'm not blurry when I expand my face. Or if I go to a different camera, maybe I'm not blurry. I am blurry there, so I'm going to just say goodbye for now. Sorry about the blurriness. I'll get that figured out. And if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat right now. If you have any questions on YouTube or Facebook, feel free to leave a comment, and I will do my best to get back to you. But if you're a student in the course and you have a question, 
I would encourage you to jump into GroupMe and ask your question there. And if you don't get an answer in GroupMe, then please feel free to shoot me a text message or an email, and I promise I'll get you an answer. So again, this week's this week's uh, lesson or assignment rather is it's a really easy assignment. It just is a, an opportunity for you to consider what it would look like in your life and your future if you decide to bargain and negotiate everything. And you're going to get a little help from my friend Ramit Sethi, who's going to have a conversation about bargaining and negotiating your salary and your next uh, promotion. So that's a very helpful interview. I hope you enjoy it, uh, and I hope you have a great week. And I don't see any questions, so I'm going to end my blurry presentation and try to fix it. So y'all have a great week ahead. Take care. You know what? I ended the meeting and I forgot to end the broadcast. So here we go. I am going to end the broadcast. <laughs> Again, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, thank you. Hit the like button. Don't forget, uh, you can hit the subscribe button right there and uh, get notified when I do another video. So I'm, I'm wondering, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, if you could leave a comment and let me know, did the screen get blurry for you uh, as well in this live stream? I'm thinking it may just be the folks who are in the Zoom room. Uh, Zoom in interacts very differently with my technology sometimes, so I'm going to figure it out. But it would be helpful if you tell me. In fact, I'll know in a minute because I'm going to go check this live stream on YouTube and see if it was blurry. But uh, anyway, leave a comment hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to hit the little bell if you want to be notified whenever I post another video. I am going to end the broadcast now, and I will see you next week.